Hello. Welcome to our study of the Word of God today. We, uh, we have a special time of the year, so I thought it would be good to do some special Bible studies for the, for the next two, maybe three weeks. Uh, we will be studying some, th some things about the Christmas story. You know, uh, this, just this last week, I heard some people talking, and they were saying that uh, the, the Bible story of Christ's birth was only a, it was only a story. It was like a myth or a fable. And, oh, it really bothered me, because I know that this story here in the Bible is absolutely true. And so I thought it would be good for us, uh, you know, this world where we're here, we're living in right now, uh, they don't know what they're talking about. And we, we cannot depend on their opinions. We must go to the Word of God for our authority. This is the foundation for our faith. And I thought it would be good for us to just kind of examine and look, look at the Christmas uh, story maybe from different viewpoint here uh, for a few weeks and uh, And I thought about some things that I want to just talk to you about and I hope they will really be a blessing for you So let's pray and we'll begin Heavenly Father we pause again as we normally do not because it's tradition, but because we need you I need you and so I ask you to help me to teach clearly today. I pray that the Word of God would come off the pages here and become real to all of us who are studying together today. I pray that you would bless uh, the folks who are watching today. Some are excited about uh, Christmas time. It's going to be a, a time for a family to gather together and fellowship. But other people maybe are going to be alone this Christmas. And I pray that you would touch each heart. I pray that these things that we talk about today will be an encouragement to all who are watching today. I pray that your, your hand would be obvious here and that you will work in my heart and in the hearts of the people there who are watching. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I want to talk about today, if you have your Bible, open to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. The, the, uh, the Christmas story is really contained in two different of our New Testament books, Matthew and Luke. And here I want you to, I want you to focus on Luke chapter 2 with me today. We're just going to look at a few verses. Uh, these are wonderful verses. Uh, the verses I have memorized because I've heard them and I've talked about them so much with our children. I can I remember our children growing up in uh, in Christian school and then memorizing these verses and and saying them in Christmas programs in front of everybody and uh, it was so encouraging to me. And today I want to examine some things with you. But my my topic for today is that God chose a manger manger I'm going to be signing manger God chose a manger God chose for the place where Jesus Christ would be born a very simple humble place when you think about the birth of the king of all kings Jesus Christ when you think about the birth of the Messiah I would think that God would have allowed Jesus Christ to be born in a palace, in a fancy, beautiful gold everywhere and silver everywhere and diamonds. I would have thought he would have been born on a soft silk uh, thing to lay on a bed, be soft and comfortable for him. But that's, that is not what God chose. You understand, Jesus Christ's birth did not just happen. This birth was in the plan of God from eternity past. And God's choice for the place where Jesus would be born was not a palace, but it was a cave, a, a, pl a place where the animals lived. And the very 
place, this specific place where Jesus was laid for the first time, was a place where the animals would eat the hay from, the, the manger, that manger there. Simple, a simple place for the king of all kings to be born. I want you to see in Luke chapter 2, I want you to see verse 7. It says there, and she, that is Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. You see here very simply said in verse 7, that Mary had, she gave birth to her first son. By the way, Mary would have other children. That's why it says here in the, in the verse, the firstborn son. Uh, Jesus Christ was born, if you remember, Mary had, ne had never known a man in a sexual way. She was a virgin herself. She was pure and clean. And God had chosen her to be the mother of the Messiah. When, when Mary, had, when she gave birth to Jesus Christ, it says here in verse 7, the first thing that she did, what did she do? She wrapped him up in swaddling clothes. It's not even really clothing. It's kind of like rag, rags. She wrapped him up so he would be warm, and she laid him in a manger. And I want you to think about that manger, that manger. Drop down just a few verses to uh, same, the same chapter, chapter 2, and now we're going to talk about the shepherds who were dwelling there on the hills of Bethlehem. And they heard from the angels, and they, they heard an announcement as well. And the angel told them, verse 11 and 12, it says in verse 11, uh, the angel is speaking to the shepherds, and the angel says, For un unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Do you see it again here? Uh, lying in a manger. Now I think about that. This baby already had many, many names from the Old Testament. The book of Isaiah, in chapter 9 and verse 6, it gives Jesus Christ, this baby laying in the manger, already has many, many titles already that he has. Uh, he is called Wonderful. That baby is called Counselor. The baby is called the Mighty God. Uh, Jesus is called also the Everlasting Father. And last it says he is the Prince of Peace. All of those titles fit perfectly Jesus Christ there laying in the manger. And I think about that. God did not choose the rich person's home to have Jesus born in comfort and wonder and everything. Uh, nurses there to take care of him and, and special medic, medical things there if, if there was uh, an emergency. No, none of that. He is born and he is placed in a manger. And I think about that. And that's where I really want to focus our, our thoughts today. I want you to think about with me um, what that humble beginning means to you and I. I want you to think for just a little bit about what that means for us. Uh, there are three things that I want to show you to start. First, the place where Jesus was born was humble. It was, it was really a barn. It, it was not fancy. It was not a fancy hotel. No. All the places where people would stay to sleep overnight, uh, all, of the, um, all of the hotels or the inns, they were full. No, no, there was no room for them, no place for them. 
And so when Mary gives birth to her son, the only place they could find was this humble place, a, a barn with the other animals. If you, if you think about that, the animals who that were in, not who, the animals that were in the barn there had been created by Jesus Christ. And they looked and they saw the, the cows and the sheep and the, the goats and the, and the different things that were there. They saw the birth of the king of all kings in that humble place. He was laid in a manger, the, the place where the animals would eat from. They would come and eat and, you know, slobber and all those things in there. It was a humble place where Jesus was born. Second, I want you to see, it was not only a humble place, but he was born to a humble couple. Joseph was a humble man. Uh, Joseph, you know, he could have divorced Mary. He, he could have put her aside and shamed her, but... Joseph had seen in a dream that this baby is the Son of God, and Joseph humbled himself. And he allowed himself to become the earthly father of the Messiah. Uh, Joseph is a humble man. Mary herself, now, some of our religions have exalted Mary to a place that Mary would not be comfortable with that. And it's not in our Bible. Some have said that Mary was perfect herself. That's not true. The Bible never tells us that. I, I believe Mary was a wonderful person. She was a wonderful lady. But, but Mary herself was humble. If you remember, when she met with her, her cousin, Elizabeth, earlier, before she uh, gave birth to Jesus Christ, before, she met with her cousin Elizabeth, and she said, I am the servant of the Lord. I am, she called herself the handmaid of the Lord. Mary herself, all throughout her life, was a humble person. So God chose a humble place, but He also chose a humble couple. And third, I want you to see that Jesus Christ's birth was announced to humble people. The only group, the only group that heard an announcement about the birth of Christ were a humble group of shepherds. And if you think about that, um, Jesus Christ the Son of God, of all the people on the earth at that time who could have heard an announcement, God chose to send the angels to a group of shepherds. Now understand, in that time, shepherds were not important people. What did they do? They sat and they watched, they guarded, they made sure that the sheep had grass enough to become, you know, to stay healthy. Um, they, they guarded them from wolves and, and uh, different, different animals that would try to you know, destroy the sheep. And really, their job, most of the time, very, very, very boring. And on this night, they sat there on that hillside, and they heard the announcement of the birth of Jesus Christ. And they, they must have thought to themselves, why us? We are just humble shepherds. Why would God announce to us? But God did. And I want to tell you today, God is still announcing Himself and showing Himself to humble people. Remember, uh, we, talked about, we talked about three humble things. Uh, Jesus was born in a humble place in the manger. He was born to humble parents and the announcement of his birth was given to a humble group of shepherds. So I want you to see even in the birth of Jesus Christ 
we can see that this manger, being the choice of God, was to show us some things that would come after. For example, Jesus himself would be known for being a humble man. If there was any person who could brag and say, I, I demand you do this for me or that for me, it was Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. Uh, Jesus Christ spoke and things were, were created in those six days of creation week. Jesus Christ was part of that. Jesus Christ deserves all of the praise and the honor and the respect that we could give him and more. He deserves. But he came here. The Bible tells us in the New Testament book of Philippians that Jesus humbled himself. And so as we see this, this, uh, this humble place, this humble couple, and these, these humble people, we see a theme that's going to work throughout all of the New Testament. Jesus Christ chose some people to become his disciples. He chose 12 men. Those, those men would be the people who would take up the responsibility of leading the church into this new time where the church was established. And he chose and he chose and he chose 12 people. I want you to think about, he chose men who caught fish for their living. Uh, not in important people. He chose some people who were tax collectors. Uh, you would say, uh, tax collectors? Why would he choose them? I don't know. But I'm going to tell you right now that Jesus Christ chose humble people. He used these 12 men to do some incredible things. But he chose humble people. And he used humble people. I want you to think about the, uh, the, the people that Jesus touched during his three-year earthly ministry. I, I made a list of some, some people who Jesus touched and, and went to and, and ministered to these people. He, he went to lepers. No other people wanted to go near to a leper. But Jesus Christ went to them and healed them. He, he met with lame people. He, he met with blind people and deaf people. He met with uh, children. He, he met with women. Uh, one woman we know is called the woman at the well. She has a bad reputation, but Jesus Christ went to her. And the last person that I put on, on my list, and there are many, many, many. I didn't in include all. But the last per person I put on my list was the thief, the thief on the cross next to Jesus Christ. I want you to see that Jesus Christ humbled himself all the way through his life. He was born in a humble place born to humble parents, and Jesus Christ himself demonstrated humility all through his life. We see Jesus Christ as a humble Savior. Jesus himself, if you think about it, if you look back on Jesus' life, he allowed the devil to tempt him for... Uh, um, for, he, he tempted him after he had fasted. He had not eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. The devil came and tempted him. And Jesus Christ humbled himself to that. Uh, the second thing I thought about is he allowed the, the enemies of God to challenge him without just killing them. Understand, Jesus Christ had the power that he could have killed any person he wanted who disagreed with him. But he never did that. He allowed them to challenge him. He, he allowed the soldiers to mock him at the cross. Uh, he allowed the, the men to, to crucify him. He humbled himself. He, he, if you think about it, before he was crucified, his last time alone with his disciples, he took up a bowl of water and went around and washed the feet of all his disciples. 
there's dirty, smelly feet. Uh, Jesus washed. He humbled himself. And, and I think about, one of the things that I think about that really touches my heart the most, when uh, Judas Iscariot came to betray Jesus Christ, to betray, betray Jesus Christ, when he came to meet Jesus, and Jesus saw him, he called him what? Right. He said, friend. He called Judas his friend. You see, Jesus Christ is a humble, humble man. So why am I talking to you about this topic? Well, because I believe that today one of the things that is missing so much from our our nation, really our churches even, are people who are truly humble. I want you to, to turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to I wanna show you a few verses there, and they really touch my heart, but 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul wrote this book of uh, Corinthians to a church who was struggling. And I believe that one of the reasons they were struggling was because they had allowed pride to grow up in their church and it was controlling people. And you and I need to understand we, we live in danger of that happening with us as well. And so we want to be careful that we don't allow that to happen. But Paul... He wrote some wonderful verses here in this first chapter of 1 Corinthians. And I want you to see, I want to, I want to share with you, I think, four verses I'll share, and then I'll be finished today. But I want, to, I want to share these verses, and I want to just kind of examine each verse real quickly, if we could. Again, we're thinking about the topic, why would God choose the manger? And, and I want you to keep that in your mind. Hold it there. Think about it a little bit. But Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we'll begin in verse 26. He said, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. The verse says, Paul says, Have you noticed? You folks here in the church, have you noticed that when God is calling people, He's not looking for wise men. He's not looking for mighty men. Uh, he's not looking for noble or like kings and having posi positions of prominence. He said not many of those people, the wise, the mighty, and the, the noble people, not many of them are called. Have you noticed in your church? Have you noticed in your Bible study group? God doesn't always choose out the top most skilled person. I'm, I'm teaching you today, I'm, I'm not the top most skilled person. My, my signs are weak many times. My, my knowledge of the Word of God is weak. Uh, I'm not the most skilled person, but if God chose me, then I want to serve Him. If God has chosen you, then God wants you to serve Him with your, with your whole heart. Do what you can. But you say, well, I'm not wise. I, I don't know enough. The, the verse says that not many wise men are called. You say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm weak, I fail, and, and I'm not perfect, I backslide some. I want to tell you, it says here that not many mighty are called. You say, well, well I, I have no position, I don't, I, I've not uh, earned a degree in college or whatever, I'm not noble. Here it says that not many noble are called. Go to the, go to the next verse, verse 27. In verse 27, verse 26, he says, these, these people are not called. Now we go to verse 27, and, and Paul says, here are the people God has chosen. Now look at verse 27. But God hath chosen 
the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Do you see the verse? It says that God has chosen weak things. Oh, or, or, or fool, foolish things to start. Uh, you say, well, I'm, I'm not wise. I'm kind of a foolish person. Uh, good news. God will choose people like you. Now, go back for just a second with me. Why would God choose a manger? Because he chooses foolish things. It says here in this verse that God doesn't, doesn't choose the mighty, but he will, he will choose the weak. And you say, I'm, I'm weak and I, I, I fail and I'm not, I don't have everything that I need. Good news. God is looking for people like you. Have you noticed a person who is mighty, uh, a person who is wise, they don't think that they need God. The truth is every person needs God. It, it doesn't matter how wise you are or how mighty you are. Every person needs God. The foolish person and the weak person, they know they need God. The wise and the mighty, they think, ah, I'm good. I don't need God today. I'm good enough myself. And any person that thinks that is in trouble. Let's go on to the next verse, verse 28, because he continues the same, the same thought of who God uses. In verse 28, he says, And the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. In this verse, it says in verse 28, it tells us that God will choose the base and despised things. What the world throws away, ah, it's not good. It's not good enough. God will choose and use. You know, one of the things that has always amazed me, I love to see uh, people who take things that other people have thrown away, you know, like trash, they throw it away, and another person says, ooh, that would make a beautiful something, and they bring it, and maybe they make a light, or they make something, that decoration for in the house, and you think, wow, I threw, I would have thrown that away in the trash, and that person made it beautiful and useful. That's what God does with us. God has the ability to take what man thinks, ah, <laughs> despised, or as it says here, the base thing, ah, oh, that's not worth anything, and throw it away. God will take those things. God will use those people the world has thrown away. Maybe the world has looked at you and said, ah, oh, that person is not worth anything. And they've thrown you away. I've got good news for you. You are the person God is searching for. God can use you. Wow. That gives me goosebumps when I think about that. And I'm thankful God uses the things that the world hates. Because that includes me. And maybe it includes you too. But God uses those things. And why would God do that? Why would God use foolish, weak, not wise people, uh, people who've been thrown away. Why would God use us? Well, the next verse, the last verse I want to show you today is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 29. And it just simply says that no flesh, that means no person, that no flesh should glory in His presence. I want to tell you today, God is looking for some humble people to use today. Why would God allow His Son to be born in the humble manger? Why? Why would God not choose, not choose to allow, allow Christ to be born into the palace, the fancy, beautiful, clean, wonderful place? Why not? Because Jesus Christ did not come here to the earth to impress people. He came here to the earth to die. Jesus Christ, the Christmas story, is not about a manger. It's not about shepherds. 
It's not about wise men coming from the east to bring gifts to Jesus Christ. It's not about that. The Christmas story truly is about the humble beginning of a humble man who would die a humble death on the cross for all the world. Jesus Christ came here to the earth not to impress a king, not to become popular, not to become rich. Jesus Christ came here to the earth. He started in a humble manger because he would die on a humiliating cross. And his whole life would be an example of humility. I want to challenge you today. Your life, does it match Jesus Christ? Or are you always trying to impress, 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 and be exalted and pushed up the ladder? If you are, today is a good day to say to God, I'm sorry. I don't want to, to become proud and boastful. I don't want that in my life. I want humility. When you pray for humility, I'm going to tell you, God will give you humble situations. And it doesn't feel good for our human nature, but it is important for our walk with God. I want to thank you for coming today and listening to my story. I love the Word of God. I love these verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you have a pen, maybe you want to get red pen and underline those verses there, verse 26 through 29. They're wonderful verses. And think about that humble baby born into not a palace, but in a barn in a manger. Mary took her son that had been born, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a humble manger. Will you allow God to humble you? It's tough, but I want that for myself. I want God to use me and humble me so He can use me to the fullest. I hope you do too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Jesus Christ coming here. Thank you that He came as a humble little baby, lived, lived in a way that proved He was humble all the way through His life, washing the feet of His disciples and different things. Oh, it impresses our heart. He was so humble. And Jesus humbled himself to the place of the death on, on the cross. Thank you for that. I'm thankful that he rose from the grave. And today he's victorious there, seated on the right hand of God with all the beauty and the, the fanciness of heaven there. I'm thankful for that. But I'm thankful for his example here. Help us to remember why you chose the manger. A humble place to begin for a wonderful, wonderful Savior. Help us to copy Jesus Christ and be humble today and impact and influence people for Jesus Christ today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so, so much for watching. I will see you next week.